Hello, my name is Will Meshnig, and I am a discussion group coordinator and member of the Student Advisory Board at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, made possible by Newman's Own Foundation. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel afterward. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we'll have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster, foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming this semester's Dole Fellow, Bob Lehmeyer. Thank you, Will, and welcome everybody. I'm glad to have you here. In addition to, uh, as Will said, the, the grant from the Newman's Own Foundation, uh, this program is also presented in partnership with the Howard H. Baker Center for Public Policy at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University, and the Frank Church Institute at Boise State University. Um, my name is Bob Blameyer, as Will said, and I am the Dole Fellow this semester. Uh, my connection to, to uh, Dole is because I used to work in the Senate for Birch Bay of Indiana and uh, wrote his biography. And there is an important piece of legislation which I want to address briefly that connected by and Dole together. They, they co-sponsored a piece of legislation that's had an enormous impact on this country. And it is also a, a, a great example of how bipartisanship at least used to work and, and maybe can work again. Uh, the legislation that passed in 1980 was called the Buy Dole Act. And to give you a brief description, I've actually pirated a page out of my own book that I'll read to you about the, about the Buy Dole Act. Buy Dole, uh, university innovations created almost two startup companies per day by 2005, two new commercial co products per day by 2013. By 2010, 6,500 new companies have been founded as a result of these innovations and 153 drugs, vaccines, and in vitro devices have been brought to market. Campus patents grew to 3,278 by 2005, as well as 4,932 academic licenses and 28,349 active licenses overall. The creation of 279,000 new jobs and support provided for another 3.8 million jobs. By 2015, the academic industry licensing created by Bai Dole had contributed up to $1.18 trillion to the U.S. economy, with $22.8 million in direct, directly reported sales from commercialized academic inventions. The biotechnical industry, so large today, is rooted in this academic research, as is nanotechnology, all of this directly tied to the policies in place because of Bai Dole. What it did was it changed the way patent law worked and that patents weren't being brought to market if the federal government had money in them. The Buy and Dole operations felt that that didn't make sense and America was falling behind in new innovations and inventions. And it, the, the bill passed and it changed the formula. The Economist magazine in 2002 wrote, possibly the most inspired piece of legislation to be enacted in America over the past half century was the Bay dole Act of 1980. Together with amendments in 1984 and augmentation in 1986, this unlocked all the inventions and discoveries that had been made in laboratories throughout the United States with the help of taxpayers' money. More than anything, this single policy measure helped to reverse America's propitious slide into industrial irrelevance. Again, this would not have happened without a co-sponsorship. Republicans and Democrats getting together in illustration on how things ought to work. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this, this program of Giants of the Senate is we have a whole generation of young people who have had no exposure to a Senate that plays a large part in our public lives, as it did in the era that we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm reminded, and each of the, fellow, the, the former speakers of this program so far have referred to this, how our bosses 
whenever a piece of legislation was being introduced, would right away look for a co-sponsor from the other party. It was a natural routine. I've got to believe that that has been somewhat lost in our current era. So I've established both in my book and in previous talks why I thought Birch Bayh was a giant of the Senate. And it was very obvious to me why Bob Dole was a giant of the Senate. But I think for those who are not so familiar with his career, before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to touch on some parts of the Bob Dole career, which is really quite impressive. You know, Bob Dole, who died last year, last December, at the age of 98, had spent eight years in the House of Representatives, 27 years in the Senate, 11 years as the GOP leader, three of those as the majority leader in the Senate. He was the chair, chairman of the Republican National Committee from 1971 to 73, which ironically was when the Watergate break-in took place, we all remember. He was the vice presidential nominee with President Gerald Ford in 1976, and then the Republican nominee for president in 1996. What I thought at the time, and I still think, was it was amazing that Bob Dole resigned his Senate seat when he ran for president. I thought that was an incredibly honorable thing to do, and I don't, I'm not sure that anybody else has ever done that or would have done it. And to me, it was always one of these things, whether you agreed with him or not, it was an honorable thing to do. You know, Bob Dole grew up in Russell, Kansas, and remained his official residence throughout his political career. He entered uh, KU, played basketball there under coach, legendary coach Fogg Allen, who I've learned much about in my visits to Lawrence, <laughs> and was on the Jayhawks basketball team as well as the track and football teams. His collegiate studies were interrupted by World War II when he enlisted in the United States Army. And while engaged in combat near Castle de Llano in the Apennine Mountains southwest of Bologna, Italy, Senator Dole was seriously wounded by a German shell that struck his upper back and right arm, shattering his coll collarbone and part of his spine. I lay face down in the dirt, Dole said. I could not see or move my arms. I thought they were missing. As uh, another soldier described, when fellow soldiers saw the extent of his injuries, they believed all they could do was give him the largest dose of morphine they dared and write an M for morphine on his forehead in his own blood so that nobody else who found him would give him a second fatal dose. Dole was paralyzed from the neck down and transported to a military hospital near Kansas. He went through a long ordeal, many surgeries, and was saved really by new drugs, as well as by the dedication of a, a Dr. Kalikian, who he remained close to for the rest of Dr. Kalikian's life. And as Senator Dole said, Dr. Kalikian had an impact on my life, second only to my family. He recovered from his wounds and eventually made his way to the Congress. During his tenure in the House, Dole voted in favor of the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He served as the ranking Republican on the Agricultural Committee from 1975 to 1978 and the chairman of the Finance Committee from 1981 to 1985. In November 1984, he was elected Senate Majority Leader. And during the 70s, he and George McGovern, Senator McGovern, worked together to pass legislation making food stamps and school lunches more accessible and fraud more difficult. They expanded the school lunch program and helped establish a special supplemental program for women, infants and children, a federal assistance program for low-income pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and children under the age of five. Together with McGovern, Dole spearheaded the elimination of the purchase requirement to receive food stamp benefits and the simplification of eligibility requirements. And then, as already mentioned, he ran for vice president in 1976. He remarked later that I was supposed to go for the jugular. He said, and I did, my own. And for, for those of us who uh, have worked in politics a long time, you come to appreciate a sense of humor. And there, there was no one that typified a sense of humor more than Bob Dole. In 1985, Sheila Burke joined his staff. Let me uh, share the bio biography of our speaker, Sheila Burke. Sheila Burke is an adjunct professor in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She served as executive dean of the school from 1996 to 2000. Previously, she'd been chief of staff to former Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole from 1985 to 1996, a professional staff member of the Senate Committee on Finance and deputy staff director of that committee from 1982 to 1985. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine 
National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration and the American Academy of Nursing. She serves on the adjunct faculty at Georgetown University and is a distinguished visitor at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, Georgetown Law Center. Center. She serves on several boards and is a member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission and on the Kaiser Family Foundation Board. She serves, also serves as a senior public policy advisor and chair of the Government Relations Policy Group at Baker Donaldson in Washington, D.C. She is married with three children, holds a master's degree in public administration from the Kennedy School at Harvard, and a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of San Francisco, and worked as a staff nurse in Berkeley, California. Sheila Burke. So Sheila, how do you go from nursing to the Senate? Thank you, <clears throat> Bob. It's great to be back at KU. I've not been here for, I think the last time I was here was the dedication of the Institute, uh, but it's wonderful having spent a lot of time in Kansas. It's all uh, pretty cool, isn't while it? While working for Senator Dole, it's really quite remarkable. Um, I actually went to work for Bob Dole in 1977 uh, and uh, was brought on board, interestingly enough, uh, I, had, I was in New York City uh, working on nursing issues and came to know people in Washington, uh, one of whom suggested to me that Senator Dole was looking for someone to handle health issues. He was then the ranking Republican on the health subcommittee for the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, it was chaired by Herman Talmadge of Georgia. The chairman of the full committee was Russell Long, a legendary uh, politician uh, in his Here's own right. Uh, quite <laughs> remarkable. Um, and I thought it would be sort of interesting. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I'm a California kid. Uh, my idea of rural was Oakland. I didn't really know, <laughs> <clears throat> didn't really know rural. And, um, you know, I said that. I was also a lifelong Democrat, Irish Catholic family, union members. Uh, but the suggestion was I interview with Senator Dole, uh, and I thought it would be an interesting thing to do. I did. I explained to him that I was, A, not from Kansas, B, not a Republican, and C, uh, left of his center, which was today probably left, but <laughs> I was left of that. Um, and his reaction and comment at the time was, what he was interested in was that I cared for patients, uh, that I'd actually been involved in patient care, and there were a huge number of health care issues coming before the Finance Committee at the time. Its jurisdiction is Medicare, Medicaid, the Maternal and Child Health Program, along with all the Social Security Act programs. Uh, and he wanted someone, there was a physician on the staff at the time, uh, on the Democratic side, and what he really wanted was someone who would some familiarity with patients. Um, it, he was remarkable in that having had the time he had uh, in the hospital, uh, following World War II, had an acute understanding and appreciation for uh, the need to support individuals uh, with public programs where, where possible and where appropriate. Uh, he would often tell the story of his own grandparents uh, having to essentially provide them with uh, welfare benefits uh, at a point in time. So he had a, a sense of where there was a role for the federal government um, and saw the opportunity at the Finance Committee I thought it would be fun to do. Uh, I'd not lived in Washington, not really done that kind of work before. Uh, and 20 years later, uh, I left the Senate when he left the Senate. So it was, uh, it was an interesting um, and unexpected twist in my career. So I went from delivering services to essentially worrying about the financing of services. But again, it was a remarkably interesting time uh, in uh, essentially the history of healthcare and the history of the Medicare Medicaid programs. So I was very lucky in that respect. But then you went on to become his chief of staff. I did. A very different world than <clears throat> I did. working on the finance committee. <clears throat> we, um, I mean, it was interesting. Um, Senator Dole went from being the ranking Republican uh, with a strange twist of circumstances where the two Republicans ahead of him on the finance committee both retired at the same time. Um, and he became the ranking on the full committee. And as a result, had the opportunity to hire staff <clears throat> and asked if I had an interest in essentially moving from his personal staff to essentially the committee staff. Uh, and again, it was a wonderful opportunity, and as he transitioned, I transitioned. Uh, when he decided to run for leader um, in uh, 1984, <clears throat> again, um, the opportunity arose. 
uh, and he gave me the opportunity to move over to the leader's office, which was again a movement from just worrying about social welfare, healthcare policy to essentially all of the issues that a leader would worry about. Um, so it was a terrific, terrific transition and an eye opener. Everything from standard missile systems to uh, to financing of the healthcare systems or to agriculture policy uh, as leader. And wouldn't you say that as leader at the time he had a, a vo di lots of different kinds of Republicans? He did. <laughs> it was a much uh, more, um, it, it was an interesting caucus. Uh, we had everything from um, John Chafee, John Hines, Jack Danforth, Dave Durenberger to Jesse Helms. Um, so as wide an array of views as you could possibly imagine within Talk the Republican Party. Uh, and, you know, it was uh, similarly on the Democratic side. Uh, there was a wide array of members as well. Um, and it's interesting, Bob, that you noted um, his injuries and his time in the hospital. One of the defining moments, I think, was that he had two colleagues in the hospital at the same time. One was Danny Inouye who became the uh, senator from Hawaii. The other was Phil Hart, who also became a senator. And he tells stories of the three of them, all essentially in a military hospital, uh, talking about what their futures would be. Dole, of course, who had planned to go to medical school um, and had uh, a career ahead of him, uh, had serious, uh, remarkably serious injuries. Danny Inouye, similarly, having lost an arm. Uh, in a way, ended up in the Senate before uh, Dole moved up, um, but talked about what their futures were going to be. And I think they stayed close friends um, throughout that period of time. And one of the things, Dole's last day in the Senate, Danny Inouye gave him a set of Hawaiian shirts for his yeah. retirement. Um, so they, they stayed very close. And the medical facility mm -hmm. they were in is now named for those three senators. Yes, yes, yes. Quite remarkable. Really quite remarkable. Um, so what was it like when he decided to resign the Senate, from the Senate and run, run for president? And did you, know, it and was did a, you concur with that decision? Um, no, I had um, terribly mixed feelings. I'm sure part of it was my own personal it future. Very, yeah, it was very what, unusual. What the hell am I going to do? Um, but, you know, it was a decision he made um, wanting to make the commitment to essentially run. And his concern was that dividing his time between worrying about managing the Senate, which was a full-time job, and running for president, uh, would put one of those at risk. And I think he decided that he was, I, he was gonna go full in. Um, uh, uh, many of us were very disappointed. We'd hoped that he would you know, make the run and uh, return to the Senate if, in fact, um, he was not successful. Uh, he was remarkable as leader. And I think his caucus recognized that. Uh, but I think he decided this was his last opportunity, having previously um, thought about running in 88, thought about, you know, sort of this was not a new thought for him. Uh, but I think he decided it was the time to, you know, go all in. And I would imagine your experience as minority leader was a lot different than the experience when he was majority leader. Yeah, majority was better. Um, <laughs> No question about it. Uh, the, uh, although he was remarkable in his relationships with Senator Bob Byrd, who was the Democratic leader um, when uh, Senator Dole was elected uh, leader on the Republican side, uh, he was followed by George Mitchell. He was followed by Tom Daschle. Uh, in each case, Dole had a remarkable relationship with each of those members. Uh, and in each case, they agreed in advance that there would be no surprises. Uh, that they would find a way to run the institution in a way that got business done. Not that he wasn't partisan when he needed to be. Um, and each of them were. Certainly Byrd was. Certainly Mitchell was. Certainly Daschle was. But they had a remarkable relationship with one another in terms of respect. We met with them each week. We'd talk about the agenda for the Senate. You know, they would tell one another where, you know, my guys aren't going to essentially, uh, you know, let that go. You know, we're going to hold you up. We're going to take a lot of time. Um, so no big surprises, but remarkable respect. And they got a lot done. And what are your views about the differences between the Senate in those days and the Senate we have now? It's a, it's a very different institution um, in many respects. It, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a number of us have thought about this, about why things are so different. 
And there was a uh, sense among the Senate when um, Senator Dole was there early on and into his term, many of them had in fact come out of the World War II generation together. Many of them had common experiences uh, and that created a bond. Um, we also spent a lot of time in Washington. Uh, the members knew one another, they knew one another's families, uh, they uh, spent time together, they traveled together, and I think it created a different kind of connection. I think one of the challenges today uh, is they spend less time with one another. Many of their families don't come to Washington, um, and so they don't have that kind of personal connection. Uh, I think they also tend not to have had the history with one another um, that many of the senators in the past had, and I think as a result, they, they have come out of essentially election results that were more partisan, more deeply divided. And I think that's reflected in some of the policies and some of the difficulty coming to agreement or closure with one another. Um, n not that there aren't you know, remarkable people on both sides, but I think it's a different institution uh, in you terms know, of process. In our last session, I was with, Peter Fenn was here representing Frank Church, and he brought up the same thing about mm -hmm. World War II mm -hmm. and that common experience, and it, made mm -hmm. it, it sort of created a different kind of character. It did, and uh, you had not only World War II uh, veterans, but you also had Korea, um, you had Vietnam, um, and I mean, one of the stories that John McCain would, would tell would be uh, coming to find out after he'd come to the Senate and been there for a period of time, uh, that Dole mentioned in passing that he had worn his bracelet, the John McCain uh, bracelet from that period of time. Um, there was a common understanding of that experience, even though they were different uh, engagements. Um, I think it created a bond among many of them. Yeah, I, 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 I find it fascinating because, mm -hmm. again, I, I, I'm befuddled in many ways about the current Senate, mm -hmm. the level of partisanship and mm -hmm. the win at all costs right. mentality we sort of. So, what was your role in the presidential campaign? Um, it was the first campaign where I literally uh, joined the, the campaign team, and I had not done it with any of the previous mm -hmm. uh, efforts at running, um, in part because we stayed behind and basically ran the institution. Um, I basically went to the campaign when he left the Senate, I left the Senate uh, in uh, July, and I essentially worked on the policy team and um, you know, policy papers, preparing for the debates. You know, if you look back, there are photographs of us baking in the sun in Florida, um, getting ready for the debates. Uh, Senator Dole was never bothered by heat or sun. And uh, you see him sitting there perfectly comfortably, and we're all uh, sort of melting uh, while we're trying to prepare him for the debates. And he used to sit on what is known as the Dole Beach, which is a, a deck in the Capitol, which is named uh, for Senator Dole currently, which is right off of the Senate floor that faces them all. It's a wonderful location. But he would sit out there, you know, full suit and tie and, you know, you know, call for the staff to come out and talk about something and, you know, we're all, you know, leave us in the air conditioning. Um, but, uh, but I moved over and did what I did for him otherwise, which was policy. You know, I, I was reading uh, what some of the things he said after that election was over, and one of my enjoy was, on his election night concession, concession speech, Dole remarked, tomorrow will be the first time in my life I don't have anything to do. I was wrong. 72 hours after conceding the election, I was swapping wisecracks with David Letterman on his late night show. Exactly. And he had quite an interesting post-Senate career. He did, he did. If you call it a career. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think he would. Uh, I mean, one, he was quite active at the law firm. Um, and um, I think it, it was, um, on the constant search for clients and supporting clients and, and doing what one would imagine. Uh, but he, uh, of course, much of his time was spent raising money for the World War II Memorial, uh, which Danny Inouye uh, arranged for a plaque uh, with Senator Dole's name to be placed at, at the memorial. Uh, but he spent a tremendous amount of time on that. He worried about the Eisenhower Memorial, Eisenhower being his real hero. Um, and you know, kept very active in a variety of ways. Comedy shows uh, <laughs> were among those things that he commercials. did. Commercials. Commercials. Uh, many of us won't forget the Super Bowl commercial uh, with Britney Spears. Um, <laughs> uh, those of you who are too young to recall, it's it's a commercial worth looking at, um, <laughs> for sure. 
Uh, there were all the issues. There was uh, Viagra, There too. was Viagra. <laughs> Um, he used to describe the apartment that they purchased uh, at the Watergate. One of the apartments they purchased was owned by Monica Lewinsky's mother and uh, was in proximity to the Dole apartment. And he would describe it as the apartment Viagra bought. Um, <laughs> so we all thought that was kind of humorous. But, um, but yes, he had quite a career. And I think people realized after the fact how funny he really was. Oh, yeah. And they didn't really see that during the course of the campaign. But those sort of, um, you know, TV shows and interviews uh, that followed uh, gave people a sense of really how remarkable he was. I think that's right. I, but it's, I also think it's not unusual for us not to see this funny side of... True. Al Gore was a very funny guy, but if you... If you hadn't seen it yourself, you wouldn't know it. Inventing the internet. Yes, yeah, well, thank was, goodness he invented he it. And, and the Dole campaign in 96 was the first campaign to have a website. First yes. presidential campaign yes. to have a website. Yes, exactly. But, but it, it really, uh, the elements of Dole that we all knew having worked for him were not as evident during the course of a campaign. Um, and I think people came to appreciate that after the fact. I, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, OK, our series is called Giants of the Senate. Mm -hmm. Who else were the giants of the Senate during your service there? Oh, gosh. Um, there were really some remarkable. Pat Moynihan, um, uh, with whom Dole basically saved Social Security. Uh, Moynihan was quite remarkable uh, in, in many respects. Um, I mean, it, it really depends um, on the issues uh, and people that, I mean, Pete Domenici, uh, who's now gone as well, Pete did a remarkable job with respect to the budget. Uh, and was really um, a terrific leader in that respect. Warren Rudman, who brought us Graham Rudman, which many people today will, <laughs> will, will complain about, but uh, Rudman, essentially, um, Jack Danforth. Um, Jack was uh, an active member of the Finance Committee uh, and uh, did a tremendous amount of work with R&D tax credits and uh, investments in research. Um, but there were really people on both sides of the aisle um, who were George Mitchell, again, uh, Mitchell, much of the Clean Water and Clean Air Act activities. Um, so they were really quite remarkable people. And do you see Senate giants these days? You know, I don't, I can't say that I know the Senate as well. No, um, I, today yeah, I, don't, I don't spend time up there anymore. Um, you know, there are certainly people that are leaders in a variety of areas uh, that are uh, of importance to us. Um, but it's a different uh, group, for sure, um, different characteristics. Um, again, they come with their own interests and activities and experiences. Um, but there isn't, uh, I can't say, someone that stands out um, as I would look back at some of the folks in the past. And I noticed he was, he was involved in the televising of the Senate. For yes. The first time too. Uh, it, you know, that to, it has to have made a difference. It made an enormous difference. Um, when I fit, first went to work in the Senate, there were no cameras at all, and we would sit in our offices with little boxes, and we would listen to the debate on the Senate floor, and we'd have to guess who was speaking, because you couldn't see anything. Um, and then they brought it. The cameras in. They were internal at first, uh, only internal. Uh, and one sort of funny side note, as they were beginning to um, uh, televise, um, the speeches got longer, uh, <laughs> and you could, tell, imagine you could tell who was on the West Coast and who was on the East Coast as to who went to the floor late in the day uh, because of the West Coast. Um, but we had a circumstance where there was a, a young staff person. There were chairs in the back of the Senate for where the Senate staff would, would be seated during the course of work in the Senate. And there was uh, one young staff person who was kind of sitting in an awkward sort of way. And uh, Senator Robert C. Byrd um, mm -hmm. saw this on television and became irate at what appeared to be kind of uh, not the most appropriate circumstance in a viewing of the Senate and had them build what we came to call the birdcage. So if you look at the Senate now, you'll see there is like a little laddered box in terms of the seats on the Senate, in terms of the staff. Those are the bird cages, um, And those came along with the televising of the Senate. Um, but it made a huge difference 
uh, in terms of people's awareness of what was taking place, the nature of the debate. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly lengthened the amount of time in some cases. The Senate, by its nature, is more deliberative uh, than the House and certainly uh, consumes more time. The rules are different and encourage or allow that to occur in the Senate. And you saw a lot of that with the televising of the Senate. Um, and there were some members who were more adept. Uh, there were senators who were quite remarkable. Bob Packwood um, was one of the most articulate debaters uh, in the Senate and could stand up without notes and go at length on the most arcane tax policy. Uh, and then there were other members for whom um, television was not a gift and uh, were more challenged in terms of their debating skills. Um, so it really became quite interesting and, and changed a lot of what occurred in the Senate. Did you have a lot of interaction with Senator Doe after the Senate? I did. Um, there were, uh, my predecessor uh, in the Senate staff was a gentleman by the name of Rod DeArmond, um, and uh, his predecessor was a gentleman named Bob Lighthizer. We were all three chiefs of staff, uh, and we made an effort to try and see him every month. Uh, or thereabouts, uh, we saw we had the opportunity to see him about a month before his his death, um, and so we kept in close touch, which was uh, which was wonderful. Yeah, that's, that's why I felt my relationship with Birch Bay went for 52 years. Yeah, we were yeah. very very lucky. Uh, I forgot the question I was going to ask you now, but it was, it's about this post Senate career mm -hmm. because I think that he got. He got a huge array of awards, and just reading the list of awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, yes, yes, which ironically was given to him by Bill Clinton. Yes, it only was a few in months fact, after Clinton defeated him. It, it was, and Leon Panetta, who was um, Clinton's chief of staff at the time, called me and um, said, "You know, the president wants to give um, Senator Dole the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Do you think he will be?" Um, responsive or pleased about that. And I said, you know, no question. I mean, he will be absolutely thrilled. And one of the funniest episodes is the scene of Dole accepting it and commenting as he accepted it that he expected to be here, um, but expected to be here for a different reason. Uh, you know, expected the key <laughs> to the house. Um, but he was enormously um, grateful. And he and Clinton had a, uh, had a good relationship subsequently and um, you know, would talk not infrequently and I think uh, had a respect for one another. What was your experience with filibusters in the Senate? And I ask um, that in light of today, it's a whole different environment. It is. Uh, it is a, um, a tool only available to the Senate, not to the House. Uh, the longest standing filibuster is still, I believe, 23 hours and some minutes that um, was Strom Thurmond during the civil rights debate. Uh, we've had subsequent um, filibusters, none quite as dramatic. Um, but an example, um, Senate, well, then um, Senator D'Amato from the state of New York uh, showed up one night on the floor and, you know, announced he was going to filibuster, basically talk. Uh, at length, it was an unrelated matter, but he wanted to talk about the last standing American typewriter company that was located in Long Island. And he went on for some number of hours. Um, <laughs> it, it was a tool that has been used for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, to essentially delay uh, the consideration of matters. Uh, one, to essentially use the time to illustrate some other issue. Uh, but it is now simply the threat of a filibuster that can stop things from occurring. And the frequency with which filibusters are threatened yeah, is much, Yeah, I was going to use the term much, sparingly in those much days. Much more frequent. And, um, it, you know, there have been questions raised as to whether or not they had to change the filibuster rules in the Senate. Um, it is a unique tool available. It is one that was believed to be the protection for the minority. Uh, in many respects, uh, as the ability to essentially um, control the narrative for a period of time. And there are strong views on both sides as to whether or not it's become an impediment. Um, again, it's rarely really taken advantage of. It's more often the threat that we're going to filibuster. Uh, and it does, um, you know, create some chaos in terms of schedule. Do you have views on that one? I do. Do you want to share them with no, us? No, <laughs> I don't. So you don't, okay. I don't, I don't. We discussed them last week. When, I don't, again, when, right, uh, right. Um, I mean, I think there are arguments on both sides. Yeah, I think, I, I think there is too. I think that anybody mm -hmm. who stands back and looks at the history has to mm -hmm. understand why 
first of all, what the role what of the Senate was. Right. What brought and, us that? Uh, yeah. With a saucer for the to, cooling to cool, saucer. And to George the house. Washington's description right. it was a saucer to cool the hot tea. Exactly from the um, from the house, or as we referred to it, the lower body. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, the lower body and the upper body. Yes, is exactly, aware of that. exactly. Well, I think we're about, we're about ready to take some questions. If anybody has any questions from the audience here. Yes. So wait, wait a second, Michael. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so the first question I was thinking about when you were talking about like your work with different uh, committees and like between senators was I was wondering what role did presidents and like their staffers play in determining like approaches to legislation mm -hmm. and like debates in the committees because obviously the president eventually has to sign the bill. Yeah, it's a terrific question. The, um, you know, there's an interesting role, a balancing act between the bodies, um, between the three branches. I mean, historically, if you look back far enough, it, we really counted on the White House to drive the agenda, to send us the budget, to essentially set the legislative plans. And the, the, the institutions, the Congress, really in the 70s began to push back against that uh, and created their own bodies, the Congressional Budget Office was essentially devised to be a tool for the Senate and the House to be able to develop their own budget estimates and not count on the agencies. They began to develop their own legislation. Um, and so it really is a balancing act. And there are periods of time that is more presidential in terms of control and periods of time when the Congress seems to be more. Think of Gingrich and the 100 days, sort of the, you know, the Gingrich um, sort of election and selection of speaker and his driving the House agenda uh, to reset the agenda. So the power really goes back and forth. At the end of the day, you're right, anything that is statutory in nature has to be ultimately conferenced and sent to the White House for signature. And so there is a constant back and forth. Uh, when we were debating the Clinton health care reform bill, we spent hours uh, with then Hillary Clinton, who was the spokesperson, uh, and her staff, um, and subsequently in other legislation, you see a constant back and forth between the White House. You hear it now, Build Back Better, the current debate over essentially the initiative from the Biden administration and the sort of back and forth as to whether it's going to be slimmed down and what the final elements will be. And it is a constant set of negotiations. Um, when you have one party in control of all three, one would think it would be easier. That hasn't been clear. Um, in often cases, it is the mixed body where you know one party controls one or two of the bodies, uh, and that forces you to come to essentially some kind of consensus. Uh, and so it's a constant source of negotiation uh, that takes place. But again, the power shifts uh, in terms of who's driving the agenda. What would you what would you describe? If, if, Bob, if Bob Dole were sitting here and I asked him what was his proudest accomplishment in the Senate? Social Security. Social Security? Um, Social Security, certainly. Um, and it was, to your earlier point, uh, a perfect example of sort of both sides coming together and saying, we've got a problem we need to fix. And he and Moynihan met on the Senate floor and decided we cannot let the Greenspan Commission essentially uh, fail in trying to save Social Security. That was during the Bush presidency? It was. Right. First um, and the, the other would be all the child nutrition programs um, and the work that he and George McGovern did mm -hmm. uh, with respect to, to WIC, uh, Women, Infants, and Children, uh, to the food stamp, what was then the food stamp program. Um, and people will look at that and say, well, it was because he was from an agriculture state and you know it, it benefited farmers. But it was really his keen understanding of the needs of certain members of the community. Um, one of my closest friends is here today, uh, who was then Mary Wheat uh, from Kansas, uh, Mary Lahosky, who did all Dole's work on the child nutrition programs. Um, but I think those two things are among his proudest, no question. And what kinds of relationships did we have with the presidents he served with? Because there's a bunch of them going back to. I guess. Uh, there, there were many. Clinton uh, went farther back. And Nixon. Uh, Carter, Nixon. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, they were each uh, individual in um, how they played out. 
Um, and frankly, Senator Dole was in a different place in terms of his own philosophy at the time. Um, you know, one would suggest, and some have suggested, that he moderated over time and became less the, as he described it, the um, the sort of real partisan, uh, which he was called on during the Ford uh, campaign mm -hmm. uh, to essentially moderate and uh, develop relationships. I think he had respect for each. He, he fundamentally had respect for the office, and um, even after he lost to Herbert Walker. Um, he made it his business to make sure Herbert Walker was successful. And, um, you know, much of the effort during the uh, Bush one uh, term was really a dole seeking to achieve his uh, goals. And that was certainly true with Reagan. The Reagan administration, when we went through all the tax reform provisions and the tax uh, efforts at that period of time, uh, with Clinton, um, you know, they certainly had a grudging administration, for, uh, uh, a grudging admiration for one another, uh, and there were areas where they were able to come. I mean, some of the welfare reform efforts that Clinton ultimately achieved began during um, the period of time. But there were times when, for example, with the Clinton reform, where Dole just said no, you know, where his caucus was going in a different direction. Um, even his caucus was divided. John Chafee, Jack Danforth, Dave Dernberger were in one direction. Um, uh, along with Bob Carey and Max Baucus and others, but he had others, Phil Graham and others, uh, who had a different point of view. At the end of the day, the leader has a remarkably challenging position because at first he's a senator from Kansas. He has to worry about his constituency. Uh, those that don't uh, learn to regret it, but he knew it, at the heart of it he had to go home to Kansas mm -hmm. uh, and represent them. Uh, he had been a chairman of a committee at times uh, with decisions that were at odds with some of his Kansas issues, but some of his caucus issues. And then as leader, he has to get all these folks together around a common theme. And when you've got people from Mark Hatfield, who was way left of the Republican Center, um, and you've got Jesse Helms, you've got to find a way to bring them together, or at times, let them go their own way. Mark Hatfield had strong views about uh, the death penalty. Uh, Bob Packwood had strong views about reproductive rights. Uh, I mean, there are times uh, uh, Hatfield cared about the Balanced Budget Act, where you just have to let them go their way. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, he found a way to work with each president, uh, but knew when he had to represent his caucus. You know, our first guest in the series was Don Ritchie, a historian of the Senate. And he pointed out that between the presidency of John Kennedy and Barack Obama, two senators. Mm -hmm. There were 50 senators that sought their presidential nomination to run for president, all unsuccessful. Right. My boss found out it, things were harder at home after he ran for president. Interesting. It was people that kind of looked at him like, you're too big for your britches. Right. And you don't right. care about us, you, you know, you, you got Went off. Big shot on us. Did he have a similar experience? Did he have troubles here after running? No. Um, he, did he ever have troubles getting reelected here? Um, you know, when he ran against Bill Roy, um, it, it was I think tighter than they expected. Um, was that seventy four? That was seven. It was before me, so it was seventy four or seventy six. Um, but he, I think, um, at the heart was such a Kansan, um, and never lost that, and came home um, frequently enough, and was. Um, I mean, everyone goes through periods of time where your constituents think you've, you know, gotten too big for your britches. And we've seen senators who've experienced that and not come back to oh, yeah. the Senate. Um, and I think he was alert to that. Um, uh, but again, he chose committee assignments that essentially assisted him. The Ag Committee is a good example. The Finance Committee is another example where he, in fact, could work on the issues that were important to Kansas. Um, but he never lost track of where he was from. And, you know, one of the remarkable things I would experience when I would come out here with him for town hall meetings or whatever it happened to be, he was amazing in that he never forgot people. And people would come up to him who he may not have seen in 15 years and would say, Senator Dole, you probably don't remember. He knew exactly who they were. He knew where they were from. He knew what their background was. Um, knew their kids, knew, you know, what their interests were. I mean, at the end of the day, he was a Kansan, and I don't think anybody forgot that. And I think he was 
um, you know, his last tour. When I saw him last, <clears throat> he indicated he wanted to come home for one more tour for all of the counties in Kansas. Uh, we sort of knew that wasn't going to happen, but his last tour, I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, that's who he was. Never forgot it. You know, he. I also read that he, he kept going to the World War II Memorial oh, every, every Saturday weekend. right up in, until he was unable. Every weekend. Um, he would go to the memorial <clears throat> and essentially um, shake people's hands, welcome them to the memorial, um, and people would be astounded. I mean, you'd, you'd have the mercy flights that would come in, the honor flights, and you would have 20 or 30 or 50 veterans show up at the World War II memorial, and he would be there, ultimately in, his, in a wheelchair, finally, um, and literally shake every hand um, and thank them for their service. It was quite remarkable. Yeah, I think what's amazing is he became a virtual celebrity after yes. he served <laughs> in the Senate. And yes. that's, it's hard <laughs> enough to become a celebrity when you are a senator, right. and m many have tried, obviously. Right. But very few become celebrities afterwards. After the fact, exactly. But again, I mean, he was involved in a variety of issues and a variety of concerns. But at the heart of it, the World War II memorial was perhaps highest on his list. Uh, of things he wanted to accomplish um, and did. And it's, it's, if you've not seen it, it's a remarkable um, celebration of that period of time. You know, I, I took my father who fought in the Marine in the South Pacific there, and people kept stopping him to say thank you for your service yeah, yeah. all day long. Quite remarkable. Yeah. And they do, they fly into National Airport, and um, they have groups of people that greet them and take them to the memorial. And it's really an emotional sight when you see it. All these veterans coming off who are now in their 90s um, and uh, going to the memorial. And it's exactly what he envisioned was a celebration. And their kids bring them and their grandkids are with them. It's really quite something. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, you know, when I interviewed Birch Bayh for the book, we did 30 hours of video interviews. Mm -hmm. And I asked him once, what was your biggest regret in your life? Mm -hmm. And he said, I wasn't old enough to fight, fight. World War II. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, um, in the course of the senator being leader, did a number of trips overseas, which is not something he'd really done before becoming leader. And one of them, uh, well, there were a number. We went back for the, uh, essentially, uh, the 50th anniversary um, of uh, the end of World War II, which was remarkable. Um, and he, you could see when he walked into the, uh, in Normandy, we were on the beach, uh, he walked into the stadium and all the veterans there recognized him. Uh, it was really quite remarkable. But he also met with the villagers who had taken care of him in the Po Valley uh, when he'd been taken off the mountain and went back to Casaldiano and met with the mayor and met with the, a lot of the families, some of whom were still there uh, from his period of time and, and essentially helped take care of him during that um, period of time. And Danny, in a way, was injured within a few miles of Dole, uh, similarly in the Po Valley. And... Um, uh, not terribly far apart in about two or three weeks apart. Is that right? Quite similar, yeah. In, in 2007, Dole joined fellow former Senate Majority Leaders Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, and George Mitchell mm -hmm. to found the Bipartisan Policy Center. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in that at all? I am. Um, uh, I was on the board for a period of time. I'm, I'm a senior advisor. Um, and the BPC has been remarkably successful. Um, in identifying issues where there is an opportunity for a bipartisan consensus. We spend a lot of time on health care related issues um, and on a variety of other issues, energy issues. Uh, Tom Daschle is very active. Uh, Bill Frist has become more active uh, as well. And it, it really is a place where they bring together different points of view and seek for common solutions. We're working on mental health at the moment. Um, and uh, some of the questions around behavioral and mental health and access. We're about to start working on workforce issues, particularly as they relate to health care and, and nursing and, and things of that nature. Uh, they've done stuff on child nutrition, um, but it's been very successful, supported by a lot of folks. And again, Alice Rivlin was involved in their work. Um, Dan Glickman is involved in their work and a lot of the agriculture work. Dan's been uh, one of the active participants. So it's been a terrific um, effort, and I will, I suspect, continue for some time. You know, I also know that he wrote a book about the humor of the presidents, yes. those presidents. Yes. I thought somebody ought to write a book about the Bob 
Bob Dole humor. Yes. Well, sort of the best, the best of. The best of, exactly. I actually quote him in my book, and maybe I shouldn't repeat the line, but a very salty remark he had after Ford pardoned Nixon in 1974. Yes, yes. Which for us was a great thing because my boss skated to re-election that, right. that year. Right, right. There was a photograph that hung in his office that was taken, I think, in the Oval, and it was um, President Nixon... Um, I have to think of who, there were four presidents, essentially, uh, all photographed. And Dole used to refer to it as, see no evil, hear no evil, and evil. Um, and evil? Which is, <laughs> um, so yes, he had a great sense of humor. Do we have any other questions here? Uh, you described earlier that uh, when you were on uh, Robert Dole's staff, that many senators shared like personal connections through shared experiences. Uh, what is one way that you would want to see the Senate or relationships between senators change so that more bipartisan legislation can pass? You know, um, an example in the context of Dole was the example of having um, come through very difficult economic times in Kansas with his family. And with that brought an appreciation of the role of government, but also the role of independence and the role of uh, individuals essentially taking responsibility for themselves. I mean, he would talk about uh, the people of Russell, Kansas, it, they had a cigar box that he kept through his entire life where people contributed to help take care of him after the war, but also recognized the role that the Veterans Administration had played. Um, I think finding where there is common experience and whether it is through your own personal family experience um, or people that you are aware of, um, people that need services, people that need help, um, the role that subsidies play in terms of the farm programs, for example, uh, and some of the challenges that are faced. I think looking for those opportunities where there is common cause um, that is less about partisanship than it is about finding a solution to essentially an agreed upon problem. Um, it will be interesting, for example, in the context of Ukraine, um, to see where people find common cause in terms of some of what's going to be described in terms of whether it's the gas, um, limitation on Russian gas imports or whether it's uh, some of the other sanctions and, and people's understanding of what that means. Um, I think that's what helps bring people together, uh, is finding rather than the areas where we're deeply divided, um, we're, today we see that there's an agreement on an omnibus appropriations bill, the 12 bills that have for fiscal 22, I mean we're halfway through the damn year, but um, there is final common cause and it was the willingness to negotiate, frankly, the defense numbers and the domestic numbers. Um, and Pat Leahy and Dick Shelby essentially um, were able to negotiate what a common interest was. Uh, and I think that's what it takes. It's, it, and they are two examples of very different people, very different views, but had common cause to essentially keep the government from shutting down and essentially moving programs forward. And I think that's what it will, uh, that's what it will take, is finding those common elements. Our next session is going to be with Luke Albee of, of Patrick Leahy's office on Great. March 23rd. And, and, and one of the things I liked about having Leahy is he represents the Senate of our era in the right. 20th century and right. the Senate of the 21st century, the current era, a long he time. Does. He does. Where do you think the tipping points were? Where were the times or the events that made the big changes happen? You know, I don't, I don't know that I know the answer to that, Bob. As I think back, I mean, you could think of the Clinton impeachment period um, as a deeply divided period of time. Very partisan. A very partisan period of time. Um, you can and think how, of. Let me interrupt there. How, how, where, where was Senator Dole in that whole thing? And um, he was an institutionalist. I mean, he's somebody who understood the role of the Senate um, and uh, the importance of that role and the importance of um, treating it with respect. Uh, very careful about language, very careful about uh, positioning um, those issues. We had a couple of other impeachments at the same, Alcee Hastings we impeached at the same time, who ultimately went congressman to the- Congressman from Florida. Ultimately became a congressman. Sort yes. of interesting, um, after we impeached him. But um, I think- people have spoken. <laughs> he was uh, remarkably sensitive about the positioning of the institution. And this was true um, during some of the um, court nominations. Um, you know, the Clarence Thomas nomination, for example, 
who was a, a nominee that Jack Danforth had supported. And again, at the end of the day, Dole tried to avoid sort of the hyperbolic sort of extreme language. Um, and I think, again, understood um, the importance of, of the institution and the decision making within the institution. And I think that's how he would feel today. Um, you know, we're about to go through another Supreme Court nomination uh, where there's likely to be, you know, potentially some extremes. We saw it in the last go around. Um, and so I think he would look again to the responsibilities of the institution and how important they are. It's a unique responsibility for the Senate in terms of nominations, um, whether it's cabinet officers or the court, and he took that very seriously. The 1980 election, in my mind, mm -hmm. not, not only the day I lost my job, but I think was a big sea change. And yes. So, in fact, Senator mm -hmm. Dole, six years later, said that had we known we were going to get the majority, we yeah. would have elected better candidates. Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of the people who won 1980 lost in 1986. Exactly, exactly. It, it was a funny, um, it, not funny in that sense, but um, I recall the someone um, saying to Senator Dole at the time, who was about to become chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, um, essentially, who's going to tell Russell Long? I mean, it, it, it sort of, you know. How are you going to break the news? It, Howard Baker sort of, I think, said that to him at the time. <laughs> uh, it was a sea change. Um, but you had, again, people in charge. I mean, Baker, Howard Baker and Robert C. Byrd enormously respected one another uh, and found a way to move forward. I mean, one of the most contentious things uh, that occurs in the course of a new Congress is the renegotiation of the committee allocations, how many members are on the committees and what the... Uh, what the margins look like. In a Senate that's 50-50, it's a m more complicated set of questions, but um, you need that kind of trust with one another to get the institution to move forward. Uh, but certainly 80, um, you know, the Gingrich... Uh, 84. Yeah. the Gingrich Revolution and the House uh, shifting for the first time in, I don't know, 30 years or some number of years. Um, and how um, that changed the dynamic as well uh, between the House and the Senate, let alone within the parties, um, where the House became very aggressive and you know had their 100-day plan, and most of it died in the Senate, frankly. Um, you know we had periods of time with the government shutdown, and um, you know Dole's view was different than that of Mr. Gingrich and Mr. Army at the time. Um, and again, Dole took seriously the responsibility of the Senate to be the cooling um, place where things would come over and we'd take the time to deliberate. But those were certainly big shifts. Uh, it was 80 and 84, no question about it. Now, were you familiar with By Dole at the time that all that happened? You know, not, not intimately. I mean, it was something I knew was occurring. It was something that he felt strongly about. Uh, and that how you incentivize universities to essentially and others to get engaged in the research mm -hmm. uh, and made sure that they had the opportunity to take advantage of that and to benefit from that. Uh, it was not an issue that I was responsible for directly, um, but it was certainly something you I know, was You know, one of the companies of. that got formed under the new rules because of the new rules was Google. Google, exactly. Uh, but there's a great story connected. You mentioned Russell Long. Mm -hmm. Huey Long's son, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, very powerful. <laughs> You may not know the story, but it had failed. My bill had failed in the Congress in 1980 because Russell Long called it the worst piece of legislation ever written. Mm -hmm. And he and he felt that the taxpayers had a nickel in it. Yep. The taxpayers yep. had the right to bring it to market, but things weren't being brought to market. We lose our election, and Jimmy Carter, who has lost his reelection, has called a lame duck session because a budget had not been passed. Mm -hmm. So after the election, we're back in in the Senate. And Russell Long calls Birch by and says, Birch, we're going to miss you here. I've enjoyed working with you. That patent bill you and Bob Dole have, it's yours. It was a parting gift. Interesting. Which raises the question, would that ever happen today? That kind of thing. Hard to imagine. But, Hard it, to imagine. but I've always thought that was just such a great story, that that was a, the, Senate, the Senate relationships, Amazing. the personal Amazing. relationships. Well, uh, the... Um, the, the Senate Finance Committee under um, Russell Long's leadership and Herman Talmadge's leadership, I mean, was a very different place, um, as you can imagine. And um, they, they were old school, deep Southern Democrats 
um, with uh, the finance committee has always been viewed as more conservative <clears throat> than, for example, what was in the labor and health committee, the help committee, um, and of course had responsibility for tax and trade and the entitlement programs, uh, but led by Southern Democrats. And so very conservative uh, on tax policy, on entitlement policies, uh, welfare policies, um, and uh, sometimes at odds with the rest of the Democratic caucus, for sure. And that was certainly true of Russell Long. Yeah. It, he was a master. A very powerful process. man. Very, very. And, and, I, and I just have to love that story because, again, it's an illustration of how different Things the Senate was. Do we have other questions? Call this a, a question of personal perspective, maybe on a lighter <laughs> note. Ken, this is, a, this is another, another dull man this here. This is another dull guy. <laughs> Ken Benjamin, long standing Washington. No, you'll like this question. Uh -oh. Because <laughs> I, I call it personal perspective. But I think a lot of people have the mistaken notion that the life of a Senate staffer is one of luxury and <laughs> prestige <laughs> and spaciousness. Right. Could you maybe dispel that a little bit by telling us what's the smallest space? or office oh. you ever worked in while a staffer for Senator Dole? Was it about the size of this room? Uh, oh man, I'd well, die I'll, for this room. I'll, I'll actually, <laughs> I'll tell you um, two related stories. Um, one, the first office was an office that they had cut in half and put a wall in. So it was probably not much larger than this little area that we're in. Um, it was, yeah, it was a former bowling alley or something in one of the Senate office buildings, but a little tiny space. Um, when I was promoted and became uh, leadership staff, they moved us over to the Capitol uh, in a you know, wonderful suite of offices right off of the rotunda that used to be a Supreme Court justice's chambers. But my office that I shared with uh, a colleague was a former men's bathroom. And if you pulled up the rug, you saw the white tile and the white tile on the walls uh, because it had been a bathroom. Uh, it, yeah, the office space was terrible. But perhaps the most compelling story, the year that we negotiated uh, the budget and we all went out to Andrews Air Force Base where we were in huddles um, with, the, uh, with the Reagan administration and the House and the Senate, the Democrats and Republicans, we went out to Andrews so we'd be removed from the Capitol on all the racket in the Capitol and we'd be able to negotiate out this, this great deal. And so we met every day um, until late in the morning. And so one morning, it was about 3 a.m. and we had finished uh, at Andrews for the day and I'm coming back into Washington and realize at the time that I was out of formula and diapers. Uh, I had all three of my children while I was on Senate staff. Oh, very smart. Always <laughs> during a recess, however. Somehow, all my kids arrived during Senate Is recesses. Right? <laughs> Dole could never understand why somebody had a child during the session. I mean, you know, don't they know it's yeah. a recess? So at 3 o'clock in the morning, I go to what was known as the Georgetown Safeway, the social Safeway yes. in Georgetown, and I'm wandering down the aisles, and it occurs to me how ridiculous it is that it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm shopping for diapers and formula. And, you know, what had my life become uh, <laughs> as I sort of rolled home? And you have this exalted position. Yeah, this <laughs> exalted position. It, the, the staff, remarkably tough group of people, um, it, it, it's no, no surprise that most of them are quite young. Um, it, many don't last for a long period of time, but they are very difficult jobs. And again, the, the success and the comfort depends on your boss. I mean, I worked for somebody who never, never failed to back me when I took a position or uh, represented him, uh, always supported us in what we did. Um, and that's not true of all members. And also having a female chief of staff was not common. It was unusual. I was the first. Um, and uh, it, that was also quite unusual. Um, a, a funny story about President Nixon that I won't tell. But yeah, being the sort of a woman and the chief of staff at the time, very few women in the Senate, very few women in charge of uh, staffs. 
uh, at the time. But um, the men and women, uh, really remarkably hardworking, uh, committed to their bosses, and um, it, it's not a lot of comfort, not a lot of big fancy office, um, and not a huge amount of pay. I mean, the pay, comparatively speaking, um, compared to others in sort of the private sector is quite different, but it's a fabulous thing to do. Oh, it's, a, it's well unbelievable doing. learning experience. Well uh, worth doing. You know, you talk about the former bathroom. Uh, I predate you by quite a bit in there. I was early there. In fact, I remember I was the by office manager when we first could get a Xerox machine in the office. Uh -huh. Where do we put it? We had a toilet removed out of one of the bathrooms uh -huh. and had the Xerox machine shoved in there. And, mm -hmm. and I ended up working for the last three years in a room 20% the size of this room, yeah. and there were seven of us in it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, the swanky, that's the, the swanky surroundings that we the all The Senate enjoy. is tough. The House is worse. The House is worse. The House yep. is worse. They have far less space and more of them. Um, the Senate's gotten a bit better, especially since they added heart. Right. We didn't um, have the heart building. But, but the spaces are really quite small, and the staffs have gotten quite large uh, in many cases, both the committee staffs as well as the personal staffs. Um, so it's not the most glamorous. Although I will admit that my last office, when we left the Capitol, was what was the Supreme Court Justice Chambers. A beautiful office, although Senator Byrd got upset with us at one point and took my chandelier away. And <laughs> <laughs> sort of showed I'll, up and I'll the, show you. sort of chandelier <laughs> was gone. Um, but uh, there are some remarkable places in the Capitol for sure. Uh, but mostly are not where the staff are. No, no. I, and it, but again, the idea that it was a swanky oh, surrounding, yes, it, exactly. it was not. Yeah, exactly. Everybody works hard. They do. And I used to find the staffs reflected the boss. If they were In many effective, uh, youngish senators, aggressive, they had a younger, aggressive staff. If they were old, like the, some of the, the committee chairs at the time, the Southern mm -hmm. Democrats mm -hmm. had older staffs, people that have been with them for 40 years and so on. Mm -hmm. I think in our last campaign, the oldest person in our campaign was 36. My goodness. I started at 18. I was a little older when I started, and a lot older when I finished. No, we are. But, <laughs> but yes, they are tend to be young. You have other questions? Well, I think that may wrap up our session. I certainly appreciate everyone... <laughs> online looking in and everyone who showed up here. Thank you very much to Sheila thank for you. joining us. And I look forward to having another session uh, in the next few weeks. Good, thank you. Thank you. So Ken, are you back here?